Hallelujah. We serve a mighty God. Amen. Amen. Well, obviously, let's stand one more time. Come on. Let's dedicate this service to the Lord. Obviously, when you look around, I hope all is well this morning, especially in this time um, in what we're going through. And so this morning, we want to just dedicate this service once again to the Lord for the Word. Um, in behalf of Pastor Danny and uh, the staff, I'm almost half of them, and uh, there's a wedding that is taking place in Austin, so immediately after the service, we'll be heading out there as well. This is why you see a lot of absence, but how many here know that God is present with us this morning? You know, and we do appreciate, again, once again, the veterans. Uh, I think we, we fall under par in a sense of saying thank you, and it seems like a seasonal thing that when we say thank you, but we do. Come on, give, give them another hand. Hallelujah. So this morning we got a lot, uh, Pastor Danny gave me a, a, a subject uh, for this morning on training up a child in the way he should go, and the minute he asked me a couple weeks ago, um, I, you know, I completely dove right into the study and navigating God's Word, and, and sometimes I feel like, you know, there's a lot more out there that could counsel us into this training up a child, but there's no better teacher than the Holy Spirit that can teach us. And so, before we do that, I, I, it, it's only fair to me uh, to share my upbringing and my uh, story behind the scenes, if you will. But let's ask the Lord in prayer uh, before we go into the Word. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we so thank you from the rising of the sun till it's going down, your Word says, we shall bless your holy name. And, Father, you are the one that is in control in our lives. You are in the midst because your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. And Father, you're here with us, Lord. Even when we exit, you, you, you're omnipresent. You have never left us nor forsake us, and we serve a mighty God. And so, Father, we pray that even those that have come in, perhaps they're depressed, may, may you encourage them. I don't know, whatever the need is, Lord, you are God that will fulfill it according to your riches and glory. That each one would be found coming in this this house, Lord, be blessed coming in and going out. That truly you would be exalted in everything that we do and everything that we say. That, Father, every need will be met accordingly, Lord. We ask now, Lord, that your word that it would, would come forth, Lord, let it be anointed. Anointed in a way that it would break every yoke of bondage, Lord. It would loose every chain. So, Father, we thank you that we will hear what the Spirit is saying to our hearts, our minds. So we thank you again for the good news, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that is certainly a, the power of God unto salvation. Use this time, Lord God, to bless us, Lord, that we can extol your name, that, the name that is above every name. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before you get seated, go ahead and hug two, three people. Greet them in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody say, God is good. God is good. Hallelujah. And we do apologize for the PowerPoints. Um, obviously, we're remodeling the, our, our, our church here, church building, and they're doing such an incredible job. But obviously, we're missing some parts here, but we can still worship God and, and hear God's word. Amen. Hallelujah. So our key text is, is found in uh, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. And it says, train up a child in the way he or she, if you will, should go that, here's the promise, that they will not depart. Say that word with me, not depart. They will not depart from me. But again, it's only fair for me to share that in my upbringing in 
my early childhood, my background in, in being in my younger days, it was kind of sort of that we were brought up in a, a religious home, if you will. We kind of knew religion. Being back home there in Hawaii, we, we were brought up in this Catholic Catholicism. We knew manners. We knew how to be respectful uh, to our peers. And my family taught us how to be, have a strong work ethic. My siblings, I had two brothers and, I'm, yeah, two brothers and two sisters. I had to kind of pause there. But God knows that I was a favorite run. Give me an amen. You, you, can, you can ask God that. But during that time when I was raised, it, it, I think there's a distinction. I, we weren't propelled into really understanding the Word of God. Really understanding that the importance and the principles and the precept is something that we need to grab a hold on on our everyday living. And the intuition of knowing that we have the Holy Spirit. I wasn't brought up that way. But just to fast forward, I had a child out of wedlock. At that time, as being a single parent raising my daughter, Jocelyn, I remember in that time, I wanted her to be in just the finest daycare in elementary school, as being a single parent at that time. And I remember during that time, you know, I needed some help, so I was on the lookout for some help, if you will. I remember this airline stewardess that I had my eyes on, and, and I, I remember during that time as being a young Christian, being newly born again, I, 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 the, the praise and worship leader, I, I, I kind of had my eyes on them. And, and now why I'm saying this is because my interests and my motives and my priorities wasn't accordingly, if you will. And so this is why I'm sharing this this morning is because in that relationship that I had, they were loyal. They, they, we had some emotional support there and some communication. But my motives and my priority, if you will, wasn't accordingly to God. Give me an amen. amen. So the more and more I started to seek God, the more and more I started to understand the character of who He is, the more and more I, I, I sang the worship and the hymns of God, I, I got more and more close, and all of a sudden things changed. My priorities started to change. My ambitions, my aspirations started to turn because of what Jesus has done. And it was in the wrong vicinity that I was in personally because I was looking in the wrong place. Give me an amen. And from that point, I knew that there was a thrust of my faith path, if you will, and understand that the foundation of our lives in bringing up our young adults, if you will, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says, there's no other foundation that anyone can lay that which is in Christ Jesus. There's no other foundation. I don't care if you're laid in a ball game. Somewhere down the line when there is stubble and hay that is built, it's going to start to diminish, and you're going to find out who really you are in Christ. Give me an amen. amen. So my motives, my ambition, my endeavors was wrong, but there's only one foundation. And I started to seek Him more. And things started to change. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 says this, If then you were raised in Christ Jesus, and how many here is raised in Christ Jesus? Come on, don't be ashamed of that. But it says that seek, long, and desire those things which is, are above. Those heavenly things, that should be our longing. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. But there's a flip side to that. So many times we can be so heavenly minded, but not earthly good. Give me an amen. amen. And so there's a balanced scale. There's an equilibrium and when we train our sons and daughters of God, if you will, that there has to be a balance, there has to be the right thrust of what our motives and our foundation is, and it is the cross and repentance. Give me an amen. amen. So I don't know this morning, what's your desire, what's my desire? Is it a good education? Is it being in a good elite university of schools? You know, I would always teach my kiddos that 
You know, you need to learn a, a, a language, a second language, and, and to learn an instrument. But what is our priorities? Really, what is our priorities is this, in, in this day and age? So we need to ask ourselves, what is success? What is the measure of success? Is it teaching them to get the, the, the wealth and the gain of materialism or to teach them the obedience of Jesus Christ? And walking into that relationship, that true relationship of not just religion, because we don't do God a favor by just being here. Give me an amen. But really propel ourselves in the heartbeat of what God has. And you know, I believe that that's the ultimate thing in raising our young people today. That's success. Because we can interpret blessings in many other different ways. Whether having a fancy home or a fancy car, having money in the bank, being healthy, which I think that is all, you know, great achievements to have. But what about those who are coming from a broken home? Or maybe they make ends meet every single month or cannot even afford their car payment or their electric bill or their water bill. How do we define success in being blessed? You know, Jesus speaks about the beatitude. Blessed is the meek. Come on. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger. Come on, this is the, the time you need to say amen. Who thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed is the poor. This is being success in the kingdom of God. And you know, in the book of Malachi, because of time constraint, Malachi chapter 2 verse 15 speaks about a godly offspring. A godly offspring that when we raise our sons and daughters of God, there has to be a parent, uh, a marriage that is instituted, given by God to raise them into the admonition of God. Amen. amen. And this is how you grow them up. You, you, you're that role model. Yes. You're, you're, you're a he and you're a she. Amen. Amen. You're a he and you're a she. Amen. And you grow them up in the admonition of God. And, and, and as you're the one that want the integrity, they will have the integrity. You want purity, they want, they don't have purity. It starts with you as the, your spouse in, in, in coming in this courtship. In Malachi that states that, that you, as you run to God, they will run to God. This is called a godly offspring that Malachi is speaking about where the prophet Elijah, where there's only four books in Malachi. And he's saying this is where it is, is, is where God has an expectancy and, and, and a responsibility as parents that we need to grow them up in the things of God. You know, just a couple weeks ago, I was doing a baby dedication and, and, and you know, it's a baby parent dedication. Yes, it's important to dedicate our kiddos as unto the Lord, but it's much more as parents, you, to train them up in the way he or she should go. Give me an amen. So guess what that qualifies you as? You've got to be faithful in the house of God. Let them know the three important homes in life, which is your family home, your church home, and your heavenly home. You need to let them know that's the important homes in life. That's our duty. You fall into the presence of God, this offspring of God, and in raising them so many times, it's not just what we say. You know how many of you know that kiddos are great observers? They, they, they carry this toolbox, and in that toolbox, you know what it has? Binoculars. Yeah, they have their own toolbox. And they, you know, what do you use to hear the heart, the, the doctors use? What do you call that? Yeah, there we go. They, they have that in a toolbox. Did you know that they're hired by the CIA? They're observers, church. Even so, you don't know it, they do. And out of that upbringing, whether you know it or not, they will hear and they will discover what you do in the mix of chaos and, and, and your telephone conversation. You might not know they, they're, they're not listening. They're listening to you. Don't get quiet on me now. They're great observers. I, you know, I remember, you know, Jonathan, I always try to teach him the home maintenance, how to, how to change the filters and do all of that. On this particular day, we we're changing the ceiling fan, and we were doing it in his room. 
One thing I teach them, don't put your finger in that, you know. <laughs> Turn off, you know. But I remember all of the, out of the blues, he just said, Dad, man, I love when mom says that. And Becca's been in the other room with my, my mom. And he grabs this as an observer. And said, she said something nice in a sense of respecting her mother-in-law just to change the channel. Let me tell you, those little things in life matters. Tell your neighbor, I'm glad you're here. So they're observers. They observe things. But let me encourage you, whatever process or stage you're in in life, I came in a later stage in my life in bringing my upbringing. It was late in a ball game. I don't know what base you're standing on, whether if it's third base or second base, but how many of you know we serve a God that can redeem the time? My mom did an excellent job in the best way she knew how. But he will redeem even if you are in that stage where you feel that the canker worm or, 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 the, or the locusts have eaten, God can redeem it. Amen. Because what man can do in a lifetime, God can do in a moment. Amen. We serve a big God, guys. Amen. And in that observing hood, I want to just encourage you. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. But when you see in Malachi, the central theme is turning our hearts towards God. It's the central theme. And here you have the prophet Elijah is a messenger speaking to the Judeans' audience. They're familiar with, with worship. They're familiar with the ordinances of God. God admonished the people, especially the priests, that they were living in this substandard sacrifice. In other words, they were under par. They were, they were giving God their, their second best. You know, so many times in our walk, in our relationship with God, we need to grade ourselves. We need to evaluate our hearts. This is all about towering church. Because the more and more you grab a hold of God, the more and more they will. Come on. The more and more you put them in the house of God and teaching them the word of God, they will start to gravitate to that. It's just hand in glove. And so the prophet was telling them there's an under par. And we need to grade ourselves. Secondly, the Israelites had violated uh, the, the marriage covenants. There was a violation of it. How many of you know the enemy just don't come in in a subtle way? It's little by little. He knows that institution, when they come together as husband and wife serving God, what happens? They can't really equip the kids the way they could. The enemy knows. He don't just come in just like that. Little by little, he'll come in. They were unfaithful. They were unfaithful, and, and there was a lot of betrayal during that era. And you know, you can never get betrayed by someone you don't know. It's somebody you trusted. It's somebody you, you, you gave your whole verbiage and heart to, and all of a sudden, there's a distrust. There's a betrayal. There's an unfaithfulness. And it was rampant in that time, in that, in that last book. It was, uh, you know, let me tell you something. It's a bridge, guys, before the Lord's coming. He's telling us, I believe this is a blueprint for us, all about being restored. But in this betrayal, this was happening over and over because the enemy knows when there's unfaithfulness, it will tamper with the kids. And, you know, sometimes it can be betrayal. Young people in school, you have your best friend. You thought it, you, it was your best friend, and all of a sudden, boom. You're under the bus because you weren't any, you know, betterment for them anymore. It wasn't easier for them. This is all about relationship. And it's getting more prominent today because it's whatever is easier. Well, if it's not easier, then vamanos. Now, work it out. Get tough. You've got to get tougher. You've got to develop more prayer life in your life. Because God has instituted that in you, whether you're a single parent or not. We've got to get tougher in the kingdom of God. And it takes you and the Holy Ghost being alone. So that you can raise your kids, your grandkids, and the people around you where they're, they're, there's no fatherhood in their, in their lives or motherhood, you can, you, we're, the, we're the answer because Jesus is the answer. Give me an amen. amen. 
But it's really up to you because we have all these choices in life. Unfaithfulness. And that's why, the, you know, you can come in and you can tell me, you know what, Pastor Gino, yeah, it's like you don't know the whole story. Yeah, I, you know, what comes around goes around. They deserve it. Fire and brimstone, God, take care of him. <laughs> come on, it's an atomic nature. It's like, oh, do, do your, jo- Lord, you got my back. You know why the enemy comes in that way? Because he wants to stop the influence in your life for the people around you. He wants to stop you right in your track to love and equip your kids. But when there, there's bitterness and you encumber that because the strength of sin is secrecy, you, you can't li- really overpower and train your kids in the right way. Give me an amen. So when you encumber unforgiveness and you have that in your heart and you take this offense because of this hurt and this, this thing that you're hurt and you're uh, bruised by, that's called a bruise of Satan. You, you can't really launch into the things of God. I know it's not easy. This is why we need the Holy Spirit. Give me an amen. Come on, give the Lord more praise for that. That's, that's a Holy Spirit. Man, don't, don't, don't panic cake the Lord. Come on, give the Lord more praise. Give, give him a praise. He's worthy. And then number three in, in Malachi speaks about the judgment is coming. It's imminent. And what happens is that, uh, I want to just kind of slow down really quick, because judgment, we think judgment, oh my gosh. You know, judgment really, if you look and you do your studies in it, it, judgment, the Lord wants to redeem you. He always gives you a redemption to get out of what's going to be this swift wrath of God. He always provides that, and thank God for Jesus. And in Malachi chapter 3, Verse 7, it says this, Yet from the day of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances, and I have not kept them. Return, that's the key word, is return to me. I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, I, in what shall I return? Here we go, this is our key text too. In Malachi 4, 6 says, He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the Father. It's all about reconciliation in growing our young adults today. Give me an amen. amen. This, I believe, is the very blueprint of what God has for us in training our kids in the Lord. Again, Proverbs 22, 6, to train up a child in the way he or she should go that they will not depart, to direct, to train, to equip, to instruct The NIV translation says to start your children off the way he should go. One of the things I want to share, even in my experience, when the going gets tough and the tough get going, when you're teaching them that you have to continually be persistent. Give me an amen. Amen. Persistent. Continually to, to be persistent. This is how you mold them and shape them into the ways of God. Look around you, church. You've got young adults that are sitting in front of you, on your left, on your right, behind you. I certainly believe they are the one, this generation, that's going to turn this world for Jesus. I believe they're, they're, they're our world changers. They're history makers. That God's going to use you. Grab a hold of God, parents. Grab a hold of God. Whether from infant all the way to the adolescent days, grab a hold of God. Because the Bible says that no eyes have seen, no ears have heard. Because God has so much. God has, listen to me, young people. God has so much in store for you. God has so much in store for you. He has a lot in store for our young adults. In Psalms 127, verse 5 says to raise up this generation in the way he or she should go. Watch this now. In other translation says, happy is the man who has his quiver full. Who has his quiver full in them, they shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. What does that mean? What does that really mean is having these arrows of what God has given you, that you're not ashamed, whether you're in a classroom, that you're not ashamed to 
preach the word and to tell them the truth. Give me an amen. amen. To stand in this culture that is ex exposing our young adults with everything. I mean, how many here know that we have a challenge? There's a lot of things that are taking place in this exposure of, of, of what's happening. But you know, one of, my, one of my things is that what I've seen is that young people today, they, they're more concerned about having the acceptance of their friends opposed to having their acceptance of their blessings of their parents. They're more concerned of that. I've seen that it, it's more that the kids are raising the parents than the parents raising the kids. Hello? But what are we going to do? Come on. Christ has given us the answer to the, the B-I-B-L-E. You know, and I get that. Parents, we do fail. We're not this superhero, if you will. I understand that we fail. I have failed a lot of times. I just want to slow down there. You know, I lost my son. And you have no idea what I've gone through as a parent. It, it was just everything just slowed down, and I'm going, I do have the answer, but I, I understand that we're not perfect as parents. And you have all these questions, and you have all these answers, and you're going, God, how do I do this? Consistency, persistence in the things of God. Sometimes life don't make sense, and God works, you know, in ridiculous ways that we cannot see. But we have to be persistent with the word and to love them in the way he or she should go. I realize that. That we also have outside equipping, outside source, whether it would be from school teachers or incredible youth pastors, incredible youth pastors, coaches. You know, we got veterans, we got officers, we, we got all these outside sources, but who is the main educators in the kingdom of God? Come on, point at your neighbor, it says you. That's, this is why, if you really look at the text, this is why judgment begins where? It's, big, it, it's with us. It starts with me, it starts with you. To whom is given much is required. We have a great accountability, and God expects that from his house, from the church. This is, this, is, this is meat. It's us. But we come in and we go out and we come in and we go out and it's a Wednesday and it's Sunday and it, we, we have to see this longing, this thrust in saying, God, there has to be change there, in our lives that we grow from glory to glory and from faith to faith. There has to be some change. We don't serve a God that, that we remain the same in 2022, now it's 2023. We're approaching that. How many know we serve a big God? We serve a big God. So he brings us from glory to glory and from faith to faith. Train up a child in, in the way he or she should go. All of a sudden, your child goes, man, I see, different, see something different in you, dad. I see something different in you, mom. You're not the same. Why? Son, it's Jesus. It's, it's really Him. It's really His grace. It's, it's really His mercy. Remember how we were? It's by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony. It's your testimony that they feed off of. Wow. God has all of this. He knows it. Train up a child. You hunger and thirst after him. The rest follows suit after you. Great exploits will follow those who believe. It happens in your kids. I like to raise those Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bandagos, who knows how to stand, young people, in the midst of the fiery furnace, who cares about the delicacies of the world or, or what the king says. You know, uh, Sergeant Major Poe mentioned about the Constitution. God ordained it. You stick with it. Whether it will cost your life, blessed is the persecuted. Hallelujah. And you know, we all, we're all built differently, right? Look on the side of you. We're all built differently. I mean, you got this hyperactive kid. They bounce off every wall. I mean, every wall, the lights and everything, you know. 
It's like, how do you train them? You've got to know who you're, who you're, you know, God has given you. It's a gift. You've got the strong-willed, you know, adolescent. You're crazy. They look at you. They walk away. Strong will. You tell another individual that is built differently, you're crazy. They go in depression for a whole month. They're built differently. You have to be creative. You have to ask God for wisdom. You have to ask God, how do I bring my child? How do I bring my nephew? How do I bring, how, how do I do it, Lord? God speaks. He's creative. He's the creator of the universe. God can move. When I was in Hawaii, he spoke to me. The turtle spoke to me, not verbally, but, you know, it just, it, it's like his creation spoke to me. It's like it, I, I was, I mean, it's, it's amazing. God is creative, too. He's a creator. We have to ask these, ourselves these questions to raise them up. Well, maybe your kids are all off and they're gone. Let me encourage you. God's going to bring somebody your way. And it's the one that you don't like. Oh, my gosh. And all of a sudden, you're trying to equip them. God is equipping you. Creating me a clean heart. Lord, I want more love. Yeah, he's going to bring somebody your way. He works in ways we don't see, guys. This is why through circumstance and what we do and what leaks out of us, they observe, they grab a hold of them much more. It's not about much more the doing. It's, it's, it's the being in more like Christ. Don't get quiet, okay? You get me nervous up here. So we realize also that there is a demonic realm. There's two influences. The enemy would love to have your kids. This is why discernment, it's real. Relationship, you have to watch. This is big, guys. I don't see it all myself. I thank God for his help. There's influences of, of, of God, too. You listen to yourself predominantly, you'll be self-made. You listen to, to man, you'll be man-made. But if you listen to God, you'll be God-made. They will be God-made. You have to know that voice because one voice that matters, that's Jesus. That's why we monitor some practicality, parents. We monitor what they watch, what they listen to, right? So many times, just, you know, I, I love that Bluetooth, right? Because when, when, when we go in a car, all of a sudden, that music comes on, and Jonathan is just shutting it off, you know? We have to monitor that. We have to monitor occasionally, not to say that we're, we're brooding over his life in a sense, but we're training because we don't want the enemy to come in. We, we, it's our job because he comes in in his fairy darts. He, he starts to do these things into their mind, into their cranium, and all of a sudden it's little by little, and they think it's normal, and they listen, and all of a sudden there's a great influence. Yeah, it's, it's just little by little. It's young people, so you've got to watch what you listen to. When mom and dad tells you no, just always think they have your back, and you have to honor them. This dedication of, of baby dedication and parents, it's, it's reciprocal. It's a connection. Well, but you don't know them. Well, I don't, but God does, and God will correct them. But your job is to honor them. Because in that training, you'll know. How many of you have been disciplined when you were younger? You didn't like that, right? You know, it's like when you get disciplined, you don't like that. But when you're older, how many older I have in a bunch? It's like, man, I'm glad they did that, right? No? Yeah. Yes, come on, Don. This is yes, and this is no. Go, everybody say yes. Yeah, because we find out later in life that, man, I'm so glad that my mom, my dad, those that raised me, spoke into my life and, you know, they used the, the, the rod, the, the water hose. I don't know what they use. You know, it's like, <laughs> don't use the hand, but, man, I'll tell you, the water hose, you, you get, it's long. You know, it's like, wham. <laughs> you know, it's part of training. My mom didn't know that verse, but that, you know, to beat your child, boom. It's, it was good. I deserved it. <laughs> she knew the rod of correction. Don't, don't, don't get quiet. It happens. It's, it's good. We need it. Give me an amen. 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 Who he loves, he chastises. Thy rod and staff comforts me. The rod represents what? 
the correction, the ch chastising, but the staff represents the heart of God, the affirmation, the love. You have to have balance. But if you use only the rod and the, just do this, do that, no, you, then you can, you can provoke them into wrath. But when you use just the, 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 the staff and just love them, miho, come here, then you can spoil them. Thy rod mm, and staff. Hallelujah. Are you with me this morning? You know, right input, right output. It's just, that's how it is. We have to know their strength, their weaknesses, that God has given them accordingly. Very important to understand that with consistency, day in and day out. Consistency to speak the word of God in their lives and to break bread. You don't have to just do communion here. Do communion at home. Teach them. You don't have to wait for once a month. Do this often. Break bread with them. Tell them about the elements. Do these things that it's important for them to understand this is who we are. This is who we are. Train them in the way he or she should go. You know why when we do that? It says when they're a child, because in that formative years, what happens is when they get older, they will not depart because they will recognize the voice of God. The Bible says the sheep shall know his voice. We know, they, they start to gravitate, man, this, I've heard it somewhere, right? It's what you have emulated in their lives and what the church, by surrounding them with the atmosphere of, of being Jesus-centered, they, 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 you don't know, they might not grab, but someday they will. And when they hear that calling into their lives, and perhaps when they're in this adolescent stage and there's a backslidden or straight away in their lives, please know it's a promise when you have trained them in the admonition of God, they will not depart from it. They'll be beckoned. The Holy Spirit will beckon them and they'll hear this voice and they'll come home. Give me an amen. Because what happens is you've created such a inner vault in their lives that you've just imputed the word of God and, and challenged them in the road of life and they hear that voice and I love what depart means. Depart means it can never be turned off. It's a promise when you teach them. So when you come here, even as adults, when you, you, you feed yourself the Word of God, it's a promise that that inner vault is being built up. So when that great event takes place in your life, every little thing that takes place in the, when you're very young is for a purpose and plan. Give me an amen. Because God has a purpose and plan for you. Give the Lord more praise. Hallelujah. He's worthy. So this morning you might ask, though, you might, what about Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who walked out, right? It's because of choice. They have a responsibility as well. And you know, as a child, they have some degree of responsibility to take ownership as well. What about Josiah's father, Amon, and, and the grandfather, Manasseh? I mean, they were the two most wickedest kings. But Josiah said, no, I'm not going to choose that. Young people, listen. They, Josiah said, I'm not going to choose that. And he followed the ways of the Lord. It's all about a choice. It's what we choose this day. Who shall we serve? And it's great that they can develop this skill of making the right choice. They have, you have to let them develop that. You've got to watch them develop that. And that's how you know in indications. It's like, you know, I know we, we Pastor Lorena lost her, her mama and you know, we, we went to the service, and it was a beautiful service. But I, I said, Becca, make sure that um, Jonathan's there, because I'm at work, and we were all going to meet there, and it was a beautiful service. It really touched my heart. Beautiful family. But all of a sudden, it's like Jonathan said, because it was a reception after, right? And so he wanted just to hang around. He wanted just to hang around, and, and we had to go because we had other obligations, but he told his mom, Mom, can I stay, and I, can I serve? And it, it, it really touched me when, when Becca shared that because that's the indication you know that there is some kind of growing up in, in his ways. And there was no other teens there. There, were, there weren't nobody in a sense where he just wanted to serve. He made his own choice. You go and I'll stay. And so as a parent, you, you, you love that. That the Jesus inside of him is growing him up in the way 
he should go. It ministers to me. And, and I had a particular individual as well was saying, you know, you know when you share testimonies, it's like, yeah, I, you know, because we had a loss and people watch us, if you will. I don't know why, but they just do and they, they see what you do, you know. Because when you, when you have a tragedy and you lose somebody, what happens is it, it's, you either go, just Lord, okay, you know. But people watched and they share that, you know, I, I thank God for your ministry. It's the God inside of us, guys, okay? I thank God for Brother Adan, his life for, for the Lord Jesus Christ. The praise and the worship team don't see the details and what they have to do and set up. And they, I thank God for their ministry. I always do in prayer. Thank God for them. See these things that we don't see behind the scene? That we play a great catalyst and a great purpose and plan in this upbringing and this, in, in, this in, the, in our home life? Yeah? It's very important for us to understand and be encouraged today. That's my job is to encourage you that when we make our choices and we run to the Lord, it's so important because out of our circumstances in life, it betters us if we choose. But so many times we can say, okay, God, you know, I want this circumstance to leave. It's too heavy. It's weighty. But God says, no, I'm, I'm doing something in your life. There's a reason. Just remain. Look to me. Because we don't understand these details. And so I, without faith, it's, it's, it's impossible to please God. It's taking that step of faith. It's like hindsight. Faith is like hindsight, right? You don't know it. Then all of a sudden you're here. You're in the land of Canaan. You're like, oh, my gosh, Lord, you were always in it. You, you were in it, Lord. Oh, my gosh, yeah. You, because faith is that little things that you have to do in the obedience of it. You will not grasp the whole big picture. But it, in its totality, who wins at the end? We do. Give me an amen. amen. At the end, we do. We know that Jesus paid it all. And God is good. Sorry, I'm watching my time because I, I, I need, I, I have the teens. I want them to share a little bit here too. So, so one of the other things, if you're taking notes, is in Hebrew, it speaks about a narrow path. When you, when, when you give restrictions and parameters for your kids, again, it's not saying you're chaining them up or not having them step out because love is risky. Give me an amen. But when you set that, especially when they're younger, you have to set parameters and restrictions in their lives to establish this absolutes. There's, there's something in it when God tells us that. There's something in it that they start to gravitate to the promises and the reward. And when you do that, there's always a reward. That the Bible says it's unspeakable and full of glory. And that's why discipline is very important. Hebrew chapter 12 verse 6 says that for whom the Lord loves, he chastises, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Oh, <laughs> Oh, it's up there now, right? Every son. I like to read it again. Is that okay? For whom the Lord loves, he chastises and he scourges every son whom he receives. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14 says this. He says, do not withhold discipline from your child. For if you beat him with a rod. Everybody say beat him. <laughs> he will not die. It's part of the teaching, guys. My, my mom knew what a stick looked like. Whether well, it's a broomstick, a bamboo stick, even a chopstick, right? It would teach me a lesson. Mom, you did good. I love you, Mom. But I was grateful. Look at this. Proverbs 22, 15 says this. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of children. This is why. The rod of correction or discipline will drive or remove them far away. It's that nature, guys. It's that atomic nature. Amen? Hallelujah. 
Teens, you come up here. I was going to ask them to kind of share something and then give me a little time here. How many appreciate the young people here? I asked them to do this little uh, poem that I kind of grabbed in my thing that I had way back. Go ahead, make your way right up here. Thank you, Jesus. Don't be shy now. Go right up all the way over there. All right. Give it up for them, guys. Hallelujah. Check test. Check one, two. Check one, two. There we go. Hang on now. Hang on. Go ahead. If I learn my ABCs, can read 600 words per minute, and can write with perfect penmanship, but have not been taught how to communicate with the designer of all language, I have not been educated. If I can deliver uh, eloquent speech and persuade with my stunning logic, but have not been instructed in God's wisdom, I have not been educated. If I have read Shakespeare and John Locke and can remember their writings with keen insight, but have not read the greatest of books, the Bible, and remember its importance in knowledge, I have not been educated. If I have memorized addition facts, multiplication tables, and chemical formulas, but have never been disciplined to hide God's word in my heart, I have not been educated. If I can explain the law of gravity and Einstein's theory of relativity, but not, but have not instructed in the unchangeable laws of the one who orders our universe, I have not been educated. If I can classify animals by their families, genes, and species, and can write a lengthy scientific paper that can win an award, but have not been introduced to the maker's purpose for all creation, I have not been educated. If I could run cross-country races, star in basketball, and do 100 push-ups without stopping, but have never been shown how to bend my spirit to do God's will, I have not been educated. If I can identify a Picasso, describe the style of Da Vinci, and even paint a portrait that gains acclaim, but have not learned that all harmony and beauty comes from a relationship with God, I have not been educated. If I graduate with perfect grades and slow am accepted to the down. finest university, but if full scholarship, but I have not been guided into a career of God's choosing for me. I have not been educated. If I become a good citizen, voting at each election and fighting for what is moral and right, but have not been told of humanity's sinfulness and hopelessness without Christ, I have not been educated. If I could play the piano, the violin, six other instruments, and can write music that moves listeners to tears, but I have not been taught to listen to the director of the universe and worship him. I have not been, edu I have not been educated. If I can recite the Gettysburg Address and the Primable to the Constitution, but have not learned about the hand of God in the history of our country, I have not been educated. However, if one day I see the world as God sees it and come to know him, whom to know is life eternal, and glorify God by fulfilling his purpose for me, then I, I have, have been, been educated. educated. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, hallelujah. There's the difference. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. See, the di difference is there. You know, we can, we can envelop all of our time and our effort into what's happening out there. Remember your homes. I'm not going to be here. My, my day will expire someday. I just know in my prayer and in my time, it's like, Lord, I want you to be glorified. All these accolades and, you know, they're, they're great achievements. But that's not going to compare to what God has in the purpose. The success. And you can do all this good stuff, which is, I, I honor that. But above all, I honor the Lord. Because I'm going to answer to him. I'm going to answer. And I want to do what's 
best for me and my household, and that's putting the Lord first. Not easy. Work, school, studies. But we can't allow ourselves to gravitate away from what God ultimately has. Because you can't take anything to heaven. But you can take one thing. is souls. Souls. That's why Malachi shares that. Here's the judgment. It's going to hit us. But those that are in the Lord, it's a reward. It's that Bema seat that the Lord's going to adorn you, as we put it, back at the foot of Christ. It's that reward that you'll have. It's that reward because of your consistency, your adoration towards God. Being faithful even in the servicehood and in what God has in our country. And you have to watch your motive because that's the thrust. I tell the teens, when, when you do the drama and skit, whatever you do, make sure you take a moment and say, God, take the glory. Because it's your motive. You're singing or you're waving the flag, Lord, it's for your glory. You're greeting somebody out there saying, hi, welcome to church. Lord, it's for your glory. Getting good grades and doing all this. Lord, it's for your glory. Lord, this service is for your glory. Train up a child in the way he should go. Yeah. Our examples to observe that they will see the love of God in, in us. Maybe you need a new beginning this morning. Just ask the Lord wherever you're at, forgive me. There's a new start. His mercy is new every morning. Well, Lord, I've been involved with so much activities, this and that, Lord. Whew, it's exhausting, overwhelming. Lord, Lord, help me. Bring me back to be faithful in the things of what you have called me to do. That's all. He, he redeems us. He, he wants us to grow. He understands what you're going through. We serve a God that doesn't, he doesn't condemn us. He wants us to grow. Well, Lord, you know what, man? I've been focusing so much on work. That's me. It's like, Lord, forgive me. Lord, open the opportunity. At, at least it's like King David, right? He, he always inquired in God. I always asked him. I always talked to him. Because he said, I, you, you, you are a man after my heart. We, you inquire in the Lord this morning, this week. Come on, let hold each other's hands and cross the aisle. We're together in this. Come on. Hallelujah. God is good. We got to do this together. We can't do it alone. Jonathan, come up here, please. Grab a mic. He's going to close us. Is that okay? We're one body. There's one Lord. One baptism, one faith. That's us. Amen? Remember, this is our family. Church, that's why we celebrate birthday three times, right? Our family, church family, and then friends, you know. Is that cool? How many of you love the Lord? Okay, you bless us, son. Father God, I pray, Lord, that, and I thank you for everyone who was able to come, Lord. I pray, Lord, for the people who weren't able, Lord, that somehow you'll still be able to touch them, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll fill everyone up here with the power of you, Lord, that you'll overflow us with your word and your power and your wisdom, Lord, that people who walk past us, that they'll feel something different about us, Lord, at work, at school, everywhere we go, that we'll be not shy Christians, not scared Christians, but we'll be able to have the power to share your word and bring people into your kingdom, Lord. I thank you for everyone who is here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a good day.